Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are getting set up here for our September, I almost said October, I'm ahead of myself, for our September Bible Study Live. And we hope that you are having a good evening. And uh, we also hope that all of our tech is working. It looks like it is, it seems like it is. Tell us if you are noticing something out of the ordinary. But otherwise, we're just excited to be here with you tonight. Um, my name is Austin Hartke. I'm the executive director here at TMC, and uh, I'm one of the folks talking with you about this Bible passage tonight. Micah, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Micah Melody. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the program coordinator at TMC. And how about you, Peter? <laughs> uh, I'm Peter, uh, pronouns they, them. I'm the development coordinator at TMC. Nice. Well, we are all excited to be here to talk about this really interesting Bible passage. We were all three saying as we were talking about it that it's one of those passages that the longer you look at it, the more you see. So uh, we're excited to talk about this one tonight. Uh, I see Amory in the chat already. Hi, Amory. Good to see you. Amory, I feel like, is one of our Bible Study Live regulars. Uh, and it's exciting now that we're back doing Bible study live again. I'm uh, betting that we are going to have more regulars show up that I'll like know you by name. Um, so it's good to good to see y'all. So sound off, sound off in chat if you want to say hi. And uh, we're going to talk about this Bible passage together. Um, the passage that we're reading from tonight is Luke chapter seven, verses one through ten which is um, a version of the story of Jesus and the centurion. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this passage and why, like, why we picked it, why it's important, <laughs> what it has to do with LGBTQI2A plus folks, if anything, um, and have a little bit of a little bit of a debate about it. Um, uh, so that's the plan tonight. Let's see. I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, Micah and Peter, what are you two reading from? I also have a new revised standard version, um, and I my version is not the newly updated. So, oh, I've got the newly updated one. Good. Then we'll see if there's any difference between those two. And I've got that version too. Nice. Okay. Do you have the updated or the non-updated? I have the updated. Nice. Okay. Cool. So for folks that want to read along with us and discuss this with us, um, go ahead and grab a Bible if you've got one near you. And if you don't have one near you, um, there are several places you can find one online. I'm going to put one in the chat right now um, in case you want to take a look at one there. If you go to uh, BibleGateway.com, not sponsored, um, <laughs> you can find like a whole bunch of different versions of the Bible and you can read in whatever version you like best. Um, so go ahead and check that out and grab the version that you like. And we may talk a little bit about differences in these versions as we go. Um, let's see, since we're both, I'm trying to remember, well, Peter, you and I did uh, the August Bible study, just the two of us. So Micah didn't get a chance to read it. So Micah, do you want to read the text for us tonight? Sure thing. All right. Um, so I'm reading from the uh, New Revised Standard Version, the older of the two. I have it locally on my the old machine. revised standard version. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the new, the old new revised standard version. Uh, because I have it locally on my machine. So this might be a little bit different if you're reading on the updated. Um uh, so this is um Matthew 7 verses 1 through 10. Wait, Luke After, 7, right? Oh yes. Thank you. I uh, yes, I was like, wait, wait, the Matthew one is different. <laughs> no, yeah, I saw a cross reference and I read the cross reference. So Luke 7, 1 through 10. Um so uh, after Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them, but when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to, to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, 
Not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Ooh, there's a lot. There's a lot there that we can unpack and talk about. Thanks, Micah. Um, so first, I guess, first question for folks in chat, for folks that are here, for everybody. Um, uh, before I even ask the normal first question that I ask, which is what stood out to you, what jumped out to you? So think about that question, what jumped out to you? But before we ask that question, why do you think we're talking about this passage? <laughs> like, is there anything about this that you immediately would go, why is this relevant to LGBTQI2A folks? Um, so let us know in the chat if you have any guesses about that. Um, Peter and Micah, before we went in and like researched more about this story, like, did you have any sense of like the fact that there might be a connection here or was there anything that you would have re read this story before and thought like, oh, there's connection here? Well, I'll start by saying, you know, I've, I think this passage for me has flown under the radar a lot. Mm. Um, and it's interesting, you know, bringing not to go too far into what we are kind of discovering, but um, I've actually read a few places that this kind of, for a lot of people or for other people that um, I was reading, this also kind of has been under the radar um, mm. as like a passage of like, oh, it's, it's, it's interesting, but not necessarily a, like a focus. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think um, I w didn't, wouldn't necessarily immediately connect this passage at just a, uh, like a, um, a glancing reading um, to the, uh, to the queer community or, um, but, and it's always, it's, it's definitely a passage that I have like mixed feelings about because, um, especially in this translation, use, use of the word slave and mm. also the fact that a centurion is a Roman soldier. Um, there's colonial implications here. There's a lot of different things. So it's, it's an intriguing passage to me, but not necessarily something I would like directly in the past, at least connect to, um, queer identity. Totally. And it's a short one too. So it's easy for it to fly under the radar because it's just a few verses. What about you, Peter? Have you had any experience with this passage before? You know, I think my main point of connection to this before was that phrase, uh, I am not worthy, that, mm -hmm. that section of the verse and how that kind of has been brought into various liturgies. So, you know, I grew up Catholic and that's part of the Catholic mass. We say it every, mm -hmm. you know, said it every week um, as part of that liturgy growing up. Um, kind of prior to receiving communion, mm. it was a prayer of like expressing our unworthiness to receive like Jesus in the Eucharist. So mm. that's that's my main point of connection with it. I wasn't aware of what we're going to talk about in terms of how it's been connected to the queer community there. Yeah, yeah. I oh sorry, go ahead, Micah. I just wanted to add that that's just right there. That's really fascinating because my context for folks um, who might be here watching. Um, and uh, I, uh, my context is very much an evangelical, somewhat Pentecostal, charismatic um, context, um, and uh, which so it's just interesting that the focus is even different. Like there, of I didn't have that connection there, but that's really actually I really love that you brought that up. That it's like actually been incorporated into the liturgy, and it's a very like the words of self of I am not worthy. Um, yeah. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and I like just kind of related um, in terms of you know how I've sort of come to understand my own queer identity. There's actually is a bit of a connection with that idea of worthiness and unworthiness. I think, um, and even when it comes to like approaching the Lord or approaching the the table of the Lord, you know, and and so sort of how like that connection to God is gate kept in different traditions, or you know, you can. Um, be worthy or unworthy to receive Jesus, um, and your queerness can have a lot to do with that. <laughs> yep. You know, so definitely, definitely some connection there just to that narrative. Yeah, totally. And like that to me, that would be my answer is like reading this passage when I was just coming across it for the first time, my connection was to the centurion who felt like he wasn't worthy, who was like, there, there must be something wrong with me, or like, I, you know, like that feeling of, of like, Jesus don't get too close because like clearly something is wrong with me and like I don't want to mess anything up for you <laughs> and like that was a thing thing that I felt 
quite a lot growing up um, of feeling like different and and especially in religious context. So like that would have been my connection had I not known anything else about this passage. Yep, big same. Yeah. I see a couple of folks in the chat. Uh, Amory says, uh, oh, Amory is, uh, yeah, saying same thing Peter said. For those in Catholic Mass, right before consecration of the Eucharist, the sentence, Lord, I am not worthy, only say the word and my soul shall be healed. That's my familiarity. Oh, I like that, that second connection there, Amory. That's really interesting. Uh, Jolene says, my first thought is that, again, Jesus highlights the faith of those the religious would not necessarily have, although not sure that completely fits. Yeah, Jesus is highlighting the faith of somebody who you might not expect. And we're definitely going to talk a little bit about that. Like, who is this centurion and why, like, what does it mean that Jesus is like, this person gets it? Um, oh, I like what Amory said there. After coming out, now I say, Lord, I am worthy. Oh, I like that. Uh, interesting about uh, origin of the word worship and what that means. Yeah, well, we'll talk more about that and like worship and the way that people um, connect to worship and Jesus as a, as a person who was actually walking around at the time. <laughs> so thanks folks. Um, the usual question I kind of ask is like, uh, our first question is what do you, what jumps out at you about this passage? And so maybe we've talked a little bit about things that have jumped out at you about the passage already, but if we haven't talked about something and you're like, Hey, this thing was the first thing that, you know, jumped out or hit me out of this passage, uh, put it in the chat and we will talk about it for sure. Um, I think maybe one good place to start with this passage is what the context is, like what was happening before all before this story happened. And so I went back to look at Luke chapter six to kind of get a sense of like what Jesus is talking about and how it might be related to earlier stuff. And in Luke chapter six, we get a couple different things. We get Jesus doing the talk about how you have to love your enemies, and we get Jesus doing the talk about how you shouldn't judge people. And then uh, the bit about uh, good trees bear good fruit and bad trees bear bad fruit, so you know a tree by its fruit. Um, and so those things are all leading up to this story. Um, so I wonder, Micah and Peter, like, do you have any sense of a connection between, like, what do you think that was an intentional lead up to this story of a person who other people might have been judging a bit, um, being like specifically as a centurion, like this is a person under who's like saying yes to Roman rule and the empire, right? So like, do you think there's any connection there between what Jesus was saying in chapter six coming into this story of the centurion? Well, that's an interesting question. I think I'm going to need to sit on that a little bit. Peter, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, same. I mean, I, I think it kind of, you know, speaks to all the complexities that we, you know, in our research about this passage, we're kind of uncovering about the different relationships at play here and the different, you know, ways in which people in this story uh, might, might be in relationships of power with each other mm -hmm. um, or might be in the in-group or the out-group in different ways, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think... Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's interesting, the good fruit and the bad, or the, you know, the good tree producing good fruit and the bad tree producing bad fruit. That one seems like an interesting connection to this to me because um, I guess because it it takes goodness and badness away from, um, it, it makes them more inherent rather than mm. like, you know, something imposed from the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the thing that, the thing that connected for me between that bit about Jesus talking about the good fruit and bad fruit with this story is that when Jesus ends this story with, you know, in nobody in all Israel, have I found faith like this? Like mm -hmm. he's saying this person is producing good fruit. Therefore right. he's kind of like assuming backwards that this person is worthy, is worthy and is worth something and is good. Despite the fact that he doesn't seem to think so about himself, you know, I don't know. I just was like, Hmm, interesting that Jesus is noticing the good fruit of this person. It's also interesting because the, um, the elders who come to talk to Jesus about this person also kind of say he's one of the good ones, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. And the reason they give is because he built them a synagogue, which I thought that was just a fascinating little tidbit that yeah. you don't get really much about. It's like, wow, he built them a synagogue. You know, mm -hmm. he doesn't share their faith or their traditions that he did this for, you know, these other people that he's in you know, a complicated relationship with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, in terms sense. of the power structures that are going on, you know. He's you get this sense that he's almost like a, a double agent, like he's working undercover. 
Yeah, because he's a representative of the colonial power that's right. you know, oppressing the Jewish people at this time and is in some way allying with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's strange. It's it's a strange thing. Well, we'll stop beating around the bush and actually talk about like <laughs> why, like what scholars have looked at this passage for and why it's important in the history of queer theology. So to give like a very short summary of uh, the reason this passage is talked about in queer theology is because of the language, well, a couple of things, but a lot of it is based in the Greek language that is used in this passage to talk about the centurion's servant or this person who's been enslaved. Um, the Greek that is used to talk about this person seems like it might be hinting at a different kind of relationship. So I'm going to read a tiny quote here. Um, this is from, oh, I got to get to my quote. Here we go. Um, this is uh, from a book called Jonathan Love David by Tom Horner, and it came out in 1978. So this is a very early work of queer theology uh, in terms of like looking at the Bible and trying to connect um, stories. So this quote says, it has always seemed to me that it was more than an ordinary concern that this Roman official displayed in the case, in this case for a mere slave. Luke uses here the word doulos, which is the ordinary Greek word for slave, but Matthew uses the word pais, or boy, in this particular context, servant boy. Pais is the same word, however, that any older man in Greek culture would use to refer to a younger friend or lover. And so that 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 I that looking at the language and going, oh, this person is called a pais, which is often used for this younger friend or lover. Um, is connected in the Matthew context. But of course, we're reading this story in Luke, right? And in Luke, um, the person is referred to as a doulos or a slave in Luke several times, but one time in verse seven, he's referred to as a pais. Um, and so there's this quote from another book called The Man Jesus Loved by Theodore W. Jennings from 2009. And he says, um, the term appears in verse 7 when the friends of the centurion who are not Judeans quote the centurion directly. Thus, the Judeans in the story regard the relationship as one between a slave and his master, while the Gentiles use the term that more readily connotes the, pr the problematic boyfriend. So we have this interesting thing here where um, the language and the Greek that is used seems to give people the feeling, at least in the non-Jewish population, that perhaps there was a sexual or romantic relationship between these two people. So that is one of the reasons why this passage is so interesting to queer theologians. Now, obviously, that's super complicated. <laughs> Micah, Peter, I know you both have some sources talking about why this is complicated. What do you want to bring to this? Yeah, um, so I'm going to drop a, a link in the chat. Let's see if I can grab it really quick. Um, so there's an interesting article on uh, Pew Spirit, um, which is a, a um, I don't, yeah, there it goes. Um, and uh, this like talks about the nature of Pais, which is the, um, again, um, in this context, like, we like it's really interesting because there's like a lot of ways that we can re, uh, bring a queer you know a queer lens um in biblical scholarship the idea of queering the text um also can refer to like looking at it through a perspective just not usually assumed um and so there's like we definitely can bring a queer lens to um to the text and to like and to see that um and uh, and uh, they actually do a really good job in that article. I really liked how they kind of reinterpret it using um, the idea of like a um, like a, a gay boyfriend um, and like reframing it in that way. Um, but we also have to be careful about um, being anachronistic and reading our own cultural context back on a different culture. And so that is um, one of the things that um, the context of what it means to have a gay relationship or a, um, a, um, or uh, a, uh, in this case, like between two, two men, um, in today's context, we think a lot about like egalitarian love. Um, in the Roman world, that probably would have looked like um, a, um, that would have looked like a older uh, person, in this case, a centurion and the, uh, a younger person um, and a, a younger boy. Um, and also could look like, um, like a master and slave um, and so it brings into context like some questions about consent, um, power dynamics, 
Um, and so uh, it's a beautiful passage and I love the way it opens up the possibility of seeing queer folks in scripture. Um, and at the same time, it's not, I don't think it's a but, it's like at the same time, there's some complexity here. Um, and so I wanted to also give another um, quick uh, link here. Um, this was an article I found um, that actually titles this, that, uh, also um, uh, as a content warning for this particular article, um, it mentions um, uh, sexual violence and rape. Um, and so just as a FYI, if you're going to look at that article, um, it's a great article, but just be aware that, that, that that's some of the content. Um, and this is by the Shiloh Project, um, which is a, they're dedicated to looking at the ways that scripture um, and religion has been used to both prop up um, sexual violence, but also can be used to fight against it. And so they, they actually, this article is actually called, um, titles this as a text of queer terror, which is, um, and so it's, that's a really, really intense, um, intense way to look at it, but I think it's worth holding the complexity of a lot of the things happening. So those are just some of the resources and that I kind of unearthed as I was reading this. And I was just, as I was like looking at this, I was like, wow, this passage is beautiful. It's deep, it's complex. There's a lot of dynamics of people. Um, on one hand, they is like the centurion is a representative of the colonial power, but at the same time the, was building a synagogue. Um, and so like, there's like interesting dynamics at play and I'm just, yeah. So. Totally. Nobody it's, it's very, there's no like easy way of being like this, like the good and bad, which we are so quick to like categorize things. And even when we were talking about fruit and trees, right? Like categorizing these things as good and bad. And in reality, so much of this is really complex and is it about identities layered on top of each other. And then the time between then and now layered on top of all of that. <laughs> and like having to see through all those layers takes a really, it's hard, it's hard to look through all those things. And so um, it's like important to know that this passage since like the 60s and 70s has been seen, especially by gay men, as an important part of the foundation of queer theology. And at the same time, <laughs> there's a lot that's problematic about it. Um, so that's why it's so worth talking about. Um, at least at least I think so. And I think we all think so. Um, Peter, I know one of the things that you found was a sort of retelling of this story, kind of getting the feelings of like um, what people were experiencing at the time. Would you mind reading us that little retelling of the story? Yeah. You mean the one from The Children Are Free? Yeah. 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 I was, yeah, I really liked how, how Micah laid all this out because I think it can be, it's so important to look at, you know, get deep into the, the cultural context and examine those questions of, you know, of power and consent and all of that. That's like so important. And I think also, you know, regardless of, of what was, you know, really happening at the time, like the, the sort of exercise of seeing ourselves and our experience in these stories can just be really meaningful, you know? Um, and so, yeah, this, this, uh, excerpt that I found from a book called The Children Are Free, Reexamining the Biblical Evidence on Same-Sex Relationships by Jeff Miner and John uh, Tyler Connolly, um, just sort of retold the story um, from the perspective of a centurion, and I thought it was really lovely. So here's that little excerpt. As he made his way to Jesus, the centurion probably worried about the possibility that Jesus, like other Jewish rabbis, would take a dim view of his homosexual relationship, perhaps he even considered lying. He could simply use the word du duolos. That would have been accurate as far as it went. But the centurion probably figured if Jesus was powerful enough to heal his lover, he was also powerful enough to see through any half truth. So the centurion approaches Jesus and bows before him. Rabbi, the word gets caught in his throat. This is it, the moment of truth. Either Jesus will turn away in disgust or something wonderful will happen. So the centurion clears his throat again and speaks again. Rabbi, my pais, yes, my pais, lies at home, sick unto death. Then he pauses and waits for a second that must have seemed like an eternity. The crowd of good, God-fearing people surrounding Jesus probably became tense. This was like a gay man asking a televangelist to heal his lover. What would Jesus do? Without hesitation, Jesus says, then I will come and heal him. It's that simple. Jesus didn't say, are you kidding? I'm not going to heal your pais. You can go on living in sin. 
nor did he say, well, it shouldn't surprise you that your paise is sick. This is God's judgment on your relationship. Instead, Jesus' words are simple, clear, and liberating for all who have worried about what God thinks of gay relationships. I will come and heal him. That's such a great retelling to like help people, like for folks that might not understand why it's important to be able to see yourself in scripture, <laughs> that's a great way of of showing people like, what if you were feeling everything this person was feeling? Yep. What would that mean for you in your faith? That's beautiful. Yeah, and it really speaks to what we were talking about earlier in terms of that idea of worthiness, right? Like mm -hmm. just this feeling that I feel like all queer people have had of like, I'm not, Am I worthy to approach Jesus? I've been told I'm not, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then That's... you finally do, and the response that you get is this, you know, immediate uh, love, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. One of the things that I noticed as I was looking at the two versions of this story, one in Matthew and one in Luke, is that in the Matthew story, the centurion goes himself and says, Jesus, will you come like heal this person? Like in the story, in the version of the story that you just read, Peter, in the Luke version of the story, the centurion sends other people to go ask Jesus. Um, and it made me think about times when we're so afraid of rejection that we have to ask somebody else to like, go be that mediator for us. Like Jesus will like you. I think you are more respectable than I am. Will you go do this thing for me? Um, so I don't know. That was the, the sort of respectability or like sending somebody to be a mediator. Um, I wonder if anybody in chat has any times when they remember having to kind of like ask somebody to go for them because they were afraid of being rejected. Micah, you seem like maybe you had something. Yeah, it just reminds me of the idea of like intercession, like the idea of an intercessor is someone who stands in between. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think maybe a, a modern wording, rewording of that is like allyship. It's an mm -hmm. active like advocacy on behalf of another. Um, and like thinking about that in the context of, um, in the Luke, Luke version of this, having knowing that there are people in the community who have been, have like witnessed the, this, centurion's character known that and sends um it's it's almost like anticipating jesus needing persuading mm -hmm. um <laughs> and but i i can think of that happening like i've definitely had moments where i know that i need to advocate for myself but i know that well, it's probably someone who like as a as a trans woman in a ministry context in in the past knowing that in the non-affirming ministry context where I found myself, I relied a lot of times on people who knew me really well and knew that like they knew my character and then would go to bat for me. Mm -hmm. And so um, when when things came up or I pushed the boundaries a little bit too far in in that context, they would they would advocate. Um, and so I, that's what it just brings to mind for me of like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, again, it's a little bit more complex than that because there's other power dynamics and social things at play too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, that's kind of one of the things that you know, uh, comes to mind for me. Yeah. One of the things that I think of, and this isn't necessarily a nice thing, but it's something that it made me think of, which is um, in, the, in the world of um, uh, like queer and trans theology in publishing, <laughs> For, we had to wait a long time for there to be like lots of cis and straight folks writing about us before we were allowed to publish books writing about us. <laughs> and like, that's kind of a, it's a not so nice version of this, but like this idea of having people and like, I don't fault those cis straight folks for like, they were probably being really good allies to the folks in their lives being like, this is the only way we can get this information out there. Right. So like, I'm really thankful that they did that. But that needing to have somebody kind of, um, it's almost a little bit like John the Baptist before Jesus type thing of like, you go first and then I'll come after you. And like, I'm going to be a little bit more radical than people were expecting. But like, if we like go by a little by little, maybe it won't be such a big deal. And I kind of wonder about these people that the centurion sent ahead. Like, who were these people and what was their connection besides just being grateful to him for building the synagogue? Like, were any of them maybe more queer folks? And maybe that's why they also had some connection. Who knows? I don't know. I just think a lot about those folks and who they might be. 
Ooh, I was I just thinking. Cat. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I just really quickly when you said like the kind of uh, sending the Jewish folks to go to go. I just in my head, this is like a little bit of imaginative reading here, but like yeah. I just imagine like you know some Jewish elders going and meeting Jesus, and on the way as Jesus is like moving, more come and they like kind of like it's it's that kind of building the momentum. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I love imaginative reading. That's part of what we're here to do. Um, I see Catherine says, I like the connection of intercessor with allyship. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Amory says the community matters versus individual faith. Yeah. So that's another interesting thing to think about here is like Jesus clearly praises the centurion's individual faith, but it's also like this all reminds me a bit of a story we're going to talk about, I think maybe next month, the story of the um, the man, the paralyzed man who's let down through the roof to see Jesus. And that's another story of like, community showing faithfulness like these people these jewish folks um who are showing faithfulness to the to the centurion by doing this thing in the same way that those friends let their friend down through the roof showing that faithfulness of of like trust and and belief in community even as it's connected to one individual so yeah thank you for that amory i'm thinking here um about um uh, let's see here. I've got lost in my own notes. I got so excited. What haven't we talked about yet, folks? Well, before I just see another uh, mention from Catherine uh, oh. says, reminds me of Jacob's reunion with Esau, sending gifts ahead of himself to try and make uh, sure Esau would be more welcoming. Totally. That's a great connection. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a little bit of buttering, buttering people up first, because you're afraid of how they're going to react. <laughs> yeah, I definitely have. Yeah. Just thinking about some experiences I've had like as a, as a trans person and those friends that are incredibly helpful by, you know, like when I was first coming out, introducing a new name, you know, having to explain myself over and over to people in my life, you know, that I had friends who would do that for me, who would kind of lay the groundwork with people where I knew that their hearts were in the right place, but they probably needed some education, you know, and I had friends who would uh, like sit down with those people before I had a conversation with them and, and and answer their questions so that I didn't have to take on like that labor and burden. And that was just such an incredible gift. So it kind of seems like maybe something similar is going on here. Yeah. And it's like, it, there's, um, there's a difference between people being like, oh, I'm going to just like do this thing and not ask the person about like what they're doing. But in this case, specifically, there are these Jewish folks are responding to the centurion's specific ask of like, will you do this for me? Mm -hmm. And that's important. Um, I'm thinking about um, how the centurion pulls from his own experience when he's trying to talk about like what Jesus is able to do. So we get this whole thing where the centurion is like, you know, I have this experience as a leader of a hundred people. Cause that's what a centurion is, is you got uh, your lead over a hundred people like century. Um, and so the centurion is like, well, I know what this looks like. Like I tell this person to go and they go and I tell them to come over here and they do that. Like, I know what it's like to do that. And I assume that you have a similar kind of power <laughs> or at least like a, a power that's in equal in, um, I don't know, in the same sort of echelon. <laughs> um, and because of that, the centurion kind of talks Jesus into it almost a little bit. Um, and so I was thinking about how like we pull as humans, we pull from our own understanding of what we can do to understand what God maybe can do. Um, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, like it gets a little wonky. Um, but I wonder if folks in the chat have like had experiences with um, like trying to understand, trying to think like, um, well, if I can do this, how much more so can God do this? You know what I mean? Like that's, I think, like I remember when I was little and my mom would use lines about like God's forgiveness. Like if God can forgive everybody all the time, then like, you can forgive people too. And that's kind of doing the same thing backwards, right? But like thinking about like, if I think of the person who has hurt me the most that I, I'm really close to, and I still feel some like compassion for that person, how much more compassion can God feel? You know, and kind of going at it that way. So I wonder if folks ever have experiences of kind of like connecting your own experiences to what God is able to do. Oh, I just well, looked at Catherine. 
I was looking at Catherine's comment. Were you just going to read Catherine's comment? No, go for it. Oh, I was going to say something else, but go for that first. Yeah. Um, Catherine says, how many times do we minimize our needs by pretexting with it's no big deal, but if you have the time, <laughs> when actually it's something really important? So true. And this person did not do that, which is really interesting. What were you going to say, Micah? Also, yes, absolutely. I feel that a lot because I, I definitely am. I totally do that. <laughs> no worries um, if not. <laughs> yes. Um, it just reminded me of um, uh, Luke 11, um, where uh, um, the ask, seek, and knock, um, mm -hmm. where Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you, seek, and you will find. Because at the very end, um, Jesus says, like, or if a child, uh, is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone, or if the child asks for fish, will give a snake? If you then, who are, um, who are evil, which there's whole context there too, uh, know how to give good gifts to your children, uh, and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good, good, uh, good things to those who ask him? Mm -hmm. So I, I just like when you were talking about kind of relating our own experience to um, and then like extrapolating that onto if we can, you know, understand this, look at the centurion, if you say go, I, I, if I say go, I know the people under me are going to go. And so if you say the word, it's going to happen like mm -hmm. that. Um, I, I think that's the first thing that I popped in my head is that little, um, is that little thing that Jesus talks about there. Totally. And it's like, that's such a powerful passage for folks that have had, um, uh, experiences of like spiritual abuse, essentially with people telling you that like God doesn't love you or doesn't care about you or won't love you if you do X, Y, or Z. Like um, you get to the point where you're more afraid of God than anything else. <laughs> and so like when you're afraid of God and then you read a passage that talks about like, Hey, if even parents know not to hand a kid something poisonous, then like how much more does God know how to take care of you? And especially if you've had bad experiences with your parents, <laughs> like that sense of like, okay, God knows better how to do this than anybody else. And maybe it's okay to trust God a little bit. So maybe the centurion felt like, you know, it, it, I know that this will happen for me if I, you know, if I want to do this, I know I can make this happen. I, I guess I wonder why the centurion thinks that Jesus has this power. Like what made the centurion think that Jesus had the power that he had? He must have just been hearing stories of healings. Um, but yeah, it's a strange thing. Like what what was the centurion thinking that Jesus was? Who knows? I'm also really interested by it, sort of, again, the contradictions when it comes to like the way the centurion is describing Jesus' power versus the way Jesus might describe his own power, mm. <laughs> you know, or the way he might understand. Because I, I read some really interesting uh, uh, research about like how how this is described as a hierarchical power, and how um, in other parts of the Gospels Jesus is really pushing back against the idea of hierarchical power. Mm -hmm. And again, the centurion is this representative of the you know this colonizing power. Um, and so he, this is the, what he's most familiar with in terms of like, this is how authority works. It works. Right. I tell you what to do and you do it. Or someone tells me what to do and I do it, you know, mm -hmm. and there's this clear hierarchy. And um, so that's how he describes it. But I, the, the source that I was looking at said that th that's really kind of in contradiction to like how Jesus himself operated. Mm -hmm. And even how the centurion was operating here, because he was really kind of upending the, this existing power structure by coming to Jesus and by how he was interacting with the community, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I and this is a, in the Matthew version again, but I, I read that um, the same, a lot of the same words that the centurion is using when he's talking about how power and authority works are the same as in Matthew 20. Um, you know, when the sons of Zebedee come to Jesus and ask if they can sit on mm -hmm. his right and his left, mm -hmm. um, and he kind of uh, corrects them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and he said, Jesus says, you know, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. And apparently those are the same words that the centurion is using mm -hmm. uh, when he talks about, you know, I, I tell someone to do this and they do it. Mm -hmm. or someone tells me what to do and I do it. So like, that's 
Jesus elsewhere says that's not how power should work. That's not how authority should work, you know? Yeah. Um, So that's just an interesting. That's a fascinating connection. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I wish I, I'm like, don't have time now, but I'm really excited (laughs) to go dive into that because that's like, that's, I've never made that connection before. Um, And I Mm -hmm. think that's, I love that connection because it's, again, it's that complexity of the power dynamics at play. Um, And so in a, in a, it, it makes me ask the question, um, like, at what point is, I, and I, I'm like, in class right now, I'll just give a little context, like, the class I'm like, in is talking about, like, Christian ethics and the, his, the history of the ways that Christianity has uh, been co-opted by empire for the purpose of exerting power over other people. And so at what point is, like, and, and Jesus is like, well, your faith has made you well, but it's like, he's believing because he's like, he's used to this form of coercive power, you know? Mm-hmm. So it makes me like wonder, like, what is the, how, how do we read that complexity, especially given the the history of Christian Christianity and empire? Yeah. Yeah. I'm really, I, it, I, I, I think a lot about, you know, for those of us living in the United States, we're kind of, you know, uh, here at the heart of empire, <laughs> you know, and to, to greater or lesser extent, you know, um, kind of participating in that or deriving benefit from it and kind of like the centurion was, you know, so like, I feel like we can see ourselves in that. Um, and he's absorbed these narratives, right, that come from being part of, you know, this structure of power. And so that's kind of what he regurgitates back is like, this is how power works. But he's not living it. Like in his actual life, he's like pushing back against that. So I, I don't know. I'm just interested by if there's like a model for us there or at least something to think about. Totally. And it also feels like there's it, it almost relates to this sense of what we are doing with this exact passage, which is some things in here connect to our real life, even though the language that we're using doesn't quite work. (laughs) So when we're talking about like queerness in this passage, like there's something there about like, uh, there's something that makes the connection, but some of the way we're talking about it is not quite right either. Um, And I don't know, the complexity of that feels like it mirrors that same complexity of like doing the right thing, even though you're kind of, not saying it in the best way. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say uh, hi to Julia Goldenheart. Hello. You're another one of our folks who has been um, at uh, Bible Study Live quite a bit. It's great to see you. And I see what Catherine says there too. God can work through our systems in ways, but also is so much more expansive and inclusive and, and, and. Agreed. Agreed. Um, one of the, uh, uh, one of the, language things. There's one more language thing that I'm going to bring up because I think it's a it's another interesting thing here. And we so we talked about the language that's used to describe this servant or this enslaved person. Um, but when the uh, centurion in, let's see, it's verse um, verse two. So in the in the new revised uh, NRSV, it says a centurion there had a slave who he valued highly, who was ill and close to death, and um, that. That bit in English there, valued highly, is something to look a little bit closer at because in the Greek, um, it doesn't maybe mean exact the, exactly that thing. So this is another quote from that book, The Man Jesus Loved by Theodore Jennings. He says, the word here is entimos. Although some of us have suggested the definition costly or valuable as the meaning here, no warrant whatever exists for that translation. As far as I can tell, the only meaning for entomos in the New Testament are honored or esteemed, as in persons of high rank, or dear, as in especially close or intimate friends. And so this thing that the the centurion is calling this person, um, it doesn't make sense to call this person highly esteemed because this person didn't have rank in the same way that the centurion did. But it does make sense that it's almost like a term, it's it's an endearing thing. This person is endeared to this person. Um, and so 
because this person was enslaved and we read that first in English, I think it's easy for us to go, oh, this, he was valued highly like in money because he was an enslaved person. But real in reality, what the centurion was probably saying is, I value him highly, like emotionally, like I care for him a lot. <laughs> and that to me seems like it might have some connection to um, uh, the centurion's own sense of like worth and like what worth is. Because the centurion has this own low sense of his own self-worth, right? But he values this person emotionally in a huge way. And so it almost seems like his it's again that tension between like what he's been taught to value like money and power versus what he actually values which seem to be like community and love and faith <laughs> and how those two things seem to be kind of not quite balanced um so i wanted to bring that translation difference um and and wondering what y'all think about this idea of like what it means to be valued highly what do you think that means um does that, is that only within like an economic sense? Is it in a, a relational sense? Uh, when we say that we value others or we value ourselves highly, what are we saying about our own worth? I guess it's kind of what I'm getting at. So I don't know. There's no real answers to these questions. I'm just thinking about what, what the questions are that are coming up for me. Those are some big questions. And like, I, looking at the Greek, um, I'm really curious. I would love to know, um, maybe someone might know more than uh, me, but like, as far as the Greek goes here, wonder what, if this is any, in any way connected to the Latin root of intimacy. Oh, um, because, uh, intimate. Yeah. because there, the, there seems to be potentially a similarity of a deep connection of value and mm -hmm. um as julia said like to be loved like that mm -hmm. like that value um that is there it's not just it's not a not a monetary value it's like a deep connection and value um and so i don't know maybe it's not but maybe it's just a coincidence that it's so similar um to the latin yeah. um roots but um but i'm just yeah i'm just curious there yeah i am too i wonder what it says in the uh in the what the Vulgate is the Vulgate? Vulgate's Latin, but I'm trying to remember. Vulgate's the Latin. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good question. I think I don't know. I feel like this whole story has a lot that it can say about how we value other people and how we value ourselves, <laughs> and so that's why I think that that translation bit was so interesting to me. Um, it, I think it says something about our translators, like people who are translating this text, that their first instinct was that this person has a high monetary value and not a high emotional value. <laughs> so translation yeah, that's, matters. That's what I was thinking about as you were talking about that, just how this this seems like a, the, an instance of a translation that actually obscures the meaning mm -hmm. of what's going on. And um, almost it, it almost feels like it must be intentional or at least sort of a, a symptom of the mind frame from which the translators were coming, you know, yeah. um, which is just kind of disappointing and a little irritating, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it might be, you know, in this version, uh, a slave who he had, who he valued highly, it might be that they were trying to combine both meanings in a English phrase that could mean either thing. But it also says something about the fact, like for me, that when I read that in English, I immediately went to economic and not emotional, right? Mm -hmm. So like that's something about me as the reader too. It might have been that they were intentionally as translators trying to get you to do both. And I just didn't do that as a reader. So I don't know. Complicated. I think this goes and illustrates why like it's important to be aware of the lenses that we bring and as well as the lenses that like the idea that translation is interpretation because mm -hmm. we bring it into a different context and so like it's important to be aware of those things and what cultural values are at play mm -hmm. and even thinking about like we're talking about you know we've been talking about the dynamics of colonialism and and empire and that are that's like present here and even thinking our reading of this is shaped by a history of colonialism and empire mm -hmm. and so like what you said like maybe there was intention to have a double meaning, but like we are going to be reading it through a lens that has been impacted that way. Right. That might influence us to read it more in a monetary sense um, where it's monetary over human life, you know, so. 
Yeah, yeah, it's totally true. Well, I have one more question about um, feelings and experiences here, and then we'll kind of close things up. But um, I'm thinking about the aftermath of this story. And I think, Micah, you also kind of were thinking of this sort of question about like, because we don't get the centurion's response, right? So what were your thoughts about like the fact that we don't get the centurion's response? What do you think happened after this? I think, I mean, I would love to hear, oh, also just to uh, see Catherine's note in the chat, the amplified version says held in honor and highly valued. Ooh, interesting. Um, so pulling out, actually pulling out that double meaning intentionally. Nice. Yeah. I love that. Oh, and the old, the King James too. Interesting. Yeah. Well, see, this is why it's important to read in many translations. Thank you, folks in the chat. So yeah, so question for folks in the chat as well here as we're talking about this. What do you think the aftermath of this story was? Because what we're left with is Jesus says this great thing. I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Like, so we get like, you know, that's the great part of the ending is everybody seems to be okay. But like, how do you think the centurion's life was changed after this, if at all? Were the friends' lives changed? Was the uh the pais, was their life changed? Like what happened after this? So I wonder what y'all think about that. And I think Mike well, had something, but go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say the first immediate thing that comes to mind is um, the centurion's pace is healed. So mm -hmm. there, the first immediate impact of what that I can think of is there is a there is a restoration of life to a person who, in the context of this the Roman world, like was uh without like political power and authority and you know so there is there is a restoration that's happening um and yes it is the centurion who is going in on behalf but it is the healing is happening to this for this person mm -hmm. um and so that's like the first thing i can think of mm -hmm. totally like how does this healing change the rest of the course of what's going on bit of the butterfly effect situation um I see Julia says that, yeah, the, there was the this sort of reuniting of the centurion and this person, this, this uh, Pais, like there's a reunification there um, that you would think probably has effects, like emotional f effects on this centurion for a long time, maybe. Um, the thing I wonder about is whether the friends told the centurion what Jesus said about him, that he had such great faith. Like, if the, because if he didn't ever actually hear that, that would be kind of a bummer. <laughs> like, I hope that the friends went back and were like, you will never believe what Jesus said about you, you know, because I feel like that would really affect the centurion's sense of himself. Um, I don't know. It's, it's so complicated because the centurion is maybe trying to just be humble by saying, yes, like the Gentile and Roman world holds me in high esteem, but I'm actually not as big as they say I am. And just trying to be humble about it when he says like, Jesus, you don't have to come here. But maybe he does really have this sense of like, I'm not good enough. And if so, would Jesus's commendation of his faith change his mind at all? Because um, sometimes people tell us really nice things about ourselves and we don't believe them. <laughs> but I remember, I, I wonder if, if maybe the centurion got to hear that and maybe it changed something for him. What do you think happened after this story, Peter? Yeah, um, I'm always interested and this is, you know, not, not based on any kind of scholarship, but again, sort of the, you know, imagination that people bring to some of these stories. And like, uh, I don't know if either of you are familiar with uh, Dorothy Sayers radio plays about the life of Jesus. Uh, I know that the, name, but I've never heard about the place. The Man Born to be King. So she wrote this and this like a, a series of radio plays about Jesus' life. Um, uh, and she was also a scholar and a linguist. So she like brings all kinds of cool scholarship into her interpretation, but she's also an incredible storyteller. Like she wrote the Lord Peter Whimsey mystery novel. So she's, mm. yeah, she's one of my favorites. But um, yeah, so she wrote this series of radio plays and she made the centurion a character that recurs every time you hear an instance of a centurion, like in the gospels, it's the nice. same person. <laughs> I love so, that. <laughs> so like 
the centurion like who's present at the foot of the cross is the same person mm. um who says like truly this was the son of god mm-hmm. so it's really I, I you know i don't again that's not based on any kind of like you know actual you know scholarship or belief that, that it really was the same person but i think it's a cool imaginative exercise and like especially to think about these these kind of one-off stories of jesus encountering people and having these relationships with them it's like what happened next yeah and like how did that relationship continue because of course it probably did he was a person with relationships you know mm-hmm. and still is <laughs> <laughs> you know so i just like yeah things. i love that like i don't maybe there are distinct like uh textual reasons why that couldn't be the same person but i'm not aware of them if they are and i like to think of like that maybe this person continued to like keep tabs on where jesus was (laughs) you know yep yep yeah love that well um i think the last thing that we'll kind of leave everybody with uh the last question that we'll leave folks with is like what what's similar what about this story is similar for queer and trans folks today and what's different because like we've talked about there's so much complexity in this story right and so some people might look at this story and go even understanding that this might be two men in a relationship of some kind even understanding that it doesn't really affect me or my life and doesn't really make me feel any closer to these stories (laughs) in which case that's totally fine or like you're you feel like the the power difference there is so great that you can't really connect. Like that's totally legitimate. Like there are lots of things about this story that might get in the way of us being to connect, uh, being able to connect, but um, there are also some similarities. And so just kind of throwing that out there as a, as a question to take away, what things are similar, what things are different from folks today, how might this connect to your life um, in some way? Uh, And I think one of the things, Micah, you were saying as you were talking about the way that you're reading text right now is thinking about like who's on the margins. And and so I think another way into this story is not just getting completely focused in on the centurion or the pais, but to go like, who else is not very well represented? And like, who else might we connect to in the story besides the main characters? So yeah, all, all thoughts to, to leave with. Um, any final words, Micah or Peter, on any of the stuff we talked about tonight that you're still going to be mulling over? I really want to look more into that connection um, of of the words of like the power and authority and the connection to um, uh, Jesus, like talking and telling um, was it uh, James and John, like don't like essentially the him being like stop doing that uh, to them because I think. <laughs> I think that's really interesting to think about um, that connection there. Um, so I think that's one thing that I'm really intrigued by. Yeah, agreed. Anything you're taking away with you, Peter? Uh, yeah, just just coming back to that idea of worth, I think, um, especially like connecting it back to what I was talking about at the beginning in terms of who's worthy to approach Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, and how those how that phrase has been used, like basically to put a barrier between people and Jesus, and mm-hmm. how the opposite is happening in this story, you know, through Jesus' own actions. So totally. that's what I'm taking away. Yeah, totally. I know. I feel like I will think about worth in this passage a little bit differently now. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for being here with us tonight. It was great to see you all in the chat. Um, And uh, thanks to everybody who joined in. Our next Bible Study Live will be on October 19th. So we're doing this once a month. It is always on the third Wednesday of the month. So if you're like, when's the next one? It's the third Wednesday of the month. And if you don't remember that it's the third Wednesday of the month, you can always go to our website, which is linked in the description of this video. And we have a calendar there with all the events in one place. So you can see exactly what's going on on what day. So uh, go ahead and check out the calendar there um, and stay aware of social media and everything else um, on the TMC accounts because of the artist market starting tomorrow. So that is going to be really, really cool. Peter, any last Friday. words about the artist market? Just that it's happening Friday, not tomorrow. Friday, not tomorrow. I'm a day <laughs> ahead of myself. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited about the artist market. I've been able to see all the work that people have contributed as I'm you know, setting up the platform, and I'm excited for the rest of the community to see it. So you'll have a chance from 
uh, September 23rd through the 30th to bid on all the works that people have donated. Um, just some really beautiful pieces of work. So yeah, stay tuned for that. Visit our website anytime during that week to see the items and bids. Yeah, you'll have a nice banner up on top of the website. You'll be able to click on and see all the art and proceeds go to TMC. So very, very cool. All right, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, we will come back to you next time and see you on October 19th. Bye, everybody.